Hello everyone, I'm Tony Damien. And I'm Andrew Rich and welcome to the latest episode of Himalayan Bites. Today, as we promised in the last episode, we are joined with our stamp duty guru, Ginny Chaman Kalanot. Ginny, thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure to be here. Stamp duty, a very important and interesting area. Viewers will no doubt recall that the Stamp Act of 1765 was the precursor to the American Revolution, but we're not in America in 1765. We're here in Australia in 2024 to talk about stamp duty. Now, Ginny, back in the day, uh, for those of us doing public MA, we used to think, well, listed entities, no stamp duty, no issue. We didn't call you about things, but have times moved on? Indeed, we are showing our age, Tony. <laughs> T times have moved on and... Um, Many things to think about in the listed space on stamp duty issues. So plenty to talk about today. Okay. What sort of things with listed entities should we be thinking about? So landholder duty rules apply to takeovers of listed entities. That, that's the big change since the very good old days. When you're looking at taking over a listed target entity, the question is, is that target entity a landholder under the stamp duty laws? And as you know, in Australia, stamp duty is a state tax, which means there are eight separate regimes that apply to the landholder duty rules in Australia. And the question is, is your target entity potentially a landholder in one of the Australian jurisdictions? That can have some unexpected consequences. So the stamp duty laws apply very broadly to land type assets, land and buildings, obviously, but there are also very large deeming rules that extend to fixed items. So you might think a wind farm could be a chattel, but under stamp duty laws, because they're fixed to land, they would be treated as a land holding. So the rules are very broadly drafted and can apply to targets across many industries. Um, landholders also include entities that you might not expect to be a landholder. So if a target entity has a number of leases Australia-wide, so as might be the case with a retail target or even a target with office space and leasehold improvements, they can also be brought into the landholder duty rules as part of the deeming rules that look at land plus leasehold improvements. So that's kind of to set the scene to say target entities can be brought into the landholder duty rules because the landholding definition is very broad. And just from the sorts of examples you're giving us, Eugenie, that is a lot broader. Wind farms, this could touch on all, all sorts of uh, transactions and takeovers that you wouldn't necessarily have thought it would apply to. You're thinking REITs, obviously, exactly. but, but it's stuff well beyond that. And, and I'd say in our experience, most targets would be a landholder of some sort because although there are dollar value thresholds to fall into the landholder duty regime, they're actually quite low. So, for example, in Victoria if there are land holdings plus fixed items of $1 million or more, that means the target will be a land holder. In New South Wales, the threshold is $2 million or more. So that brings in a lot of target entities. Mm -hmm. And so first step in looking at takeover of a listed entity from a stamp duty perspective is to look at its balance sheet to see whether it might actually be within the landholder duty rules. Very interesting. Yeah, lots of uh, traps there. And, and speaking of traps, Ginny, um, what would your advice be for those planning transactions, things to put on the to-do list? Um, in the uh, years gone by, we would often, um, in schemes, for example, not transfer the shares until the company was delisted yep. because uh, there were, at least at one point, some different rules between whether the company was listed or, or unlisted. But what are some of the things we need to be thinking about when planning our transactions? That, that, that's a really good question. So sequencing can be very important. Um, when there is an acquisition in a listed landholder, the stamp duty rates can be different depending on whether you're in the listed space from a stamp duty perspective or not. And so it is actually critical to make sure that delisting occurs after the transaction has completed because in a number of states, so Victoria, Queensland, for example, have a concessional rate that applies to a listed landholder. So, for example, the 0.65%, um, which is a concession that applies only if the acquisition occurs of quoted securities in an entity that is listed on the ASX. Um, that should actually be contrasted with uh, New South Wales, um, which has brought in the higher stamp duty rate for listed entities. So that used to be 0.55%, um, but was increased to 5.5% recently, which brought New South Wales into line with the mining states 
WA and Northern Territory, which has the full freight rate on the acquisition of listed entities. Gosh, it just goes to, to show how much planning there really is uh, on the stamp duty front on these public M&A transactions, Tony. Indeed. Uh, the other sort of transaction that's um, popular, Ginny, demergers are popular and also uh, reconstructions and, and moving assets around uh, as a precursor to a demerger or as perhaps part of a breakup deal. Uh, what do we need to think about there? So, um, demergers generally not a dutiable transaction. So, in, in terms of the landholder duty regime, when you're looking at a demerger, um, the entity itself will issue securities or have securities transferred to shareholders, generally because those shareholders are acquiring less than a 50% interest. That's not a dutiable transaction. Although there can be broad transaction aggregation rules, generally because those shareholders aren't acting under one arrangement, there's not a stamp duty liability on a demerger. The interesting thing that happens with these transactions is some kind of asset assembly will be required in order to either move assets out of the demerger entity ahead of the demerger or to assemble assets into the demerger entity. Um, unlike the income tax space, with restructure transactions, that is in principle a dutiable transaction. So if you're moving around land assets, business assets in some jurisdictions, that of itself is a dutiable transaction that requires stamp duty relief. Some states, for example, Western Australia and Queensland, in granting corporate reconstruction relief from stamp duty, will have a clawback period that says the relevant entities need to remain within the group for a three-year period, unless an exception applies. The question is then whether the subsequent demerger might qualify for an exception. So in the case of Western Australia, if the demerger falls within the Western Australian listed demerger regime, there should be an exemption for corporate reconstruction. Queensland won't give you relief for a demerger. So you can see, depending on which jurisdiction the assets are located in, whether you can get corporate reconstruction relief for a pre-demerger restructure can be complicated. And then it's about thinking about which assets are already in which entity. It goes to identifying which entity might be the appropriate entity to be demerged looking at other assets in jurisdictions like New South Wales and Victoria, which has a limited corporate reconstruction concession regime, but doesn't actually have a clawback when the demerger occurs. So it's just about looking at values of various assets, where they sit within the corporate structure and whether there's an optimum structure for a demerger entity. Which comes back to my first point, Ginny, really do need to get you involved right at the start. Indeed. The more, the more time, the better. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's important stuff. Um, thanks so much for your time today. Ginny, Andrew, what are we talking about in the next episode? Well, Tony, I think there's only one thing we can talk about, given the importance of the issues we've heard today. I think we should get someone in to talk about tax. So in our next episode, we will have a special guest from our tax team coming in to talk to us about public M&A. Can't wait for that one. See you then. Thank you.